Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and good morning. As we return to our study in Zechariah 4, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing so that we may more directly understand what he is presenting to us and presenting for us to consider at this time. Shall we ask now for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come together, to join together before you. We ask now, Father, for your direction so that our minds may be open and that that you would have us to understand may become clear. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Be with us now. Help us so that all that is done may help us to more clearly understand what it is to have a character such as yours. May your angels attend us. May your spirit open our minds. Direct us now. Be with us, each one in this study. And I pray with each one that will view this later. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, what have we been studying these last several weeks? What has the theme of Zechariah 4 been? Well, it's dealing with um, the the two olive trees and the branches, and uh, I think that's what it is. Okay. Right, um, the, the vision of the golden lampstand. And then, so... What was the theme of last Sabbath's sermon that Brother Stephen presented? What did Brother Stephen use as the basis for his study last well, Sabbath? It was Ezekiel 37, the joining of the two sticks. Okay. What was the theme of last night's study? Well, it's not fair if I answer it. Anybody? Brother William, what was the what was the theme of last night's study? Okay. Let's consider it this time. We have before us a sentence that we covered last week. When we take God at his word, when we believe on Christ without doubting, we shall see his Holy Spirit working upon human hearts. What is the underlying premise of this sentence? I'm sorry, brother. Dwight, I was in the middle of something. I'm sorry, brother. I wasn't meaning to pick on you. It's all right. I, I, it's all right. What was the theme of last night's study? I'm trying to remember, brother Dwight. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. As we have been covering in the last several Friday night meetings, are we not considering true righteousness by faith. Yes, sir, we are. Then when we read this one sentence, when we take God at his word, when we believe on Christ without doubting, we shall see his Holy Spirit working upon human hearts. What is the premise of this sentence? What is the theme of this sentence? Is this not righteousness by faith? Yes. Okay. Now, it's interesting to me because as I as I looked and I prepared for this meeting, Friday nights, Sabbath morning, and Sabbath at the divine hour, have we not all been addressing righteousness by faith? And is righteousness by faith the message of all three angels of Revelation 14. So consider this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get this other document to share. What Brother Stephen was presenting last week, I found very interesting. Because from Manuscript 85 of 1903, 
we go through this portion from Ezekiel 37. Mrs. White writes, at one time, the prophet Ezekiel was in vision set down in the midst of a large valley. Now, what vision was this in Ezekiel 37? Was this his fifth vision or was, was this a different vision? What, what vision is this? Before him lay a dismal scene. What does it mean if something is a dismal scene? Is this, is this something that is welcoming? Is this something that's positive? What do we have when we see and we state that something is dismal? Throughout its whole... Yeah, think, depressing? Yeah. Depressing is dismal, depressing? Yes. Dismal is depressing. Here's Ezekiel. He's given a very depressing scene. He's given something that is not super positive. Throughout its whole extent, the valley was covered with bones of the dead. How would you like to start your day looking at an entire valley covered with bones of the dead? The question was asked, son of man, can these bones live? The prophet replied, O Lord God, thou knowest. Ezekiel 37.3. What could the might and power of man accomplish with these dead bones? The prophet could see no hope of life being imparted to them. But as he looked, the power of God began to work. The scattered bones were shaken and began to come together, bone to his bone, and were bound together by sinews. They were covered with flesh, and as the Lord breathed upon the bodies thus formed, the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Ezekiel 37, verses 7 through 10. In the work that was accomplished on the day of Pentecost, we may see what can be done by the exercise of what? The exercise of faith. Those who believed in Christ were sealed by the Holy Spirit. As the disciples were assembled together, there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, which filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each of them. Acts 2, verses 2 and 3. And Peter stood up among them and spoke with mighty power. Among those who listened to him were devout Jews, who were sincere in their belief. But the power that accompanied the words of the speaker convinced them that Christ was indeed the Messiah. What a mighty work was accomplished. 3,000 were converted in one day. Uh, just to comment about which number of Ezekiel's vision. visions is this? It's the 11th vision. That's the 11th vision. Yeah. Now, is there... one, the, the last, actually, the last technical vision he had is in chapter 29, 17. The first day of the first month in the 27th year. This one's the 15th day of the 12th month in the 12th year. Okay. Um, so it's March 17th, 585. Um, and then he's going to have the one in chapter 40, which is the last one listed in, uh, but technically the 12th vision. So this is the 11th, the one before that. Okay. So if we, if we have here the 11th vision, is there anything symbolic that we've noted about the number 11? Well, it's half of the 22. And it's so it's part of that. that it's uh, half of the 22 and it's a 20th of 220. Yeah. Now, when this is being compared, the dead dry bones is being compared here by Mrs. White with the work that was accomplished on the day of Pentecost. Why? 
is this important for us to understand as we are looking at Zechariah 4 with the two olive trees? Here we have the disciples that have met in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Now, have they not been in that upper room for a period of nine days? Have they not been confessing their sins to one another? Have they not been seeking God in prayer and supplication? Are they not united at this time? The seed had been sown by the greatest teacher the world had ever known. For three and a half years, the Son of God had sojourned in the land of Judea, proclaiming the message of the gospel of truth and working with mighty signs and wonders. The seed had been sown, and after his ascension, the great ingathering took place. What does it mean to you that the great ingathering took place after Christ had ascended? What do we normally see when, when we're talking about ingathering? Are we not talking about a harvest? More were converted by one sermon on the day of Pentecost than were converted during all the years of Christ's ministry. 3,000 were converted in a single day, which was more than the conversion that took place through three and a half years. How many miracles did Christ do that we have recorded? How many miracles did he do that we don't have recorded? Yet, more were converted by one sermon on the day of Pentecost than were converted during all the years of Christ's ministry. You know, we were talking earlier about the number of firstborn from the book of Numbers. Here we're being told 3,000 converted in a single day is more than all that were converted in three and a half years. What does that say to us about the power of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? What does that say to us about our need to be ready? So mightily will God work when men give themselves to the control of the Spirit. God did not choose for the carrying on of his work, the learning or eloquence of the Jewish Sanhedrin, or the power of the Romans. He chose humble, unlearned fishermen to proclaim the truths which were to move the world. That they might have success in their work, he imparted to them the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by human might, nor by human power, was the work of Pentecost accomplished, but by the Spirit of God. What verse are we seeing referenced here? We've covered it multiple times. We should know this. This should be our theme. Is this not Another reference to Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Okay, comment from the, from the chat. Confessing and forsaking and forgiveness of sin is like the pruning of the crops, which result in a great harvest and ingathering. Any other thought or comment to that? Today, God is calling for men to do his work. Today, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He calls for men who will look to him alone instead of following plans of their own devising. He invites men and women to come to him, to wear his yoke, and to learn of him meekness and lowliness. As they accept this invitation, they will find that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. They will find peace in believing and joy in the Holy Ghost. Everything that has been being presented on Friday evenings, 
all that was being presented in Brother Stephen's study, all that Brother Theodore has been presenting about this in understanding God's love, is this also not tied right back in with righteousness by faith? The highlighted portions that we're going to deal with are now again before you. When we take God at his word, when we believe on Christ without doubting, we shall see his Holy Spirit working upon human hearts. Did the leadership of the church in 1888 take God at his word and did they believe on Christ without doubting? Did they manifest the consecration that they should have and are we manifesting the consecration that we should have at this time? Mrs. White said, we have not learned the lesson of humility and meekness, which is essential for us to learn. We are still on the losing side. Those who teach the truth, as well as those who will receive it, have yet to learn the most difficult lesson given to man to learn. They must realize the nothingness of human wisdom. Is this not a nice way of saying that the righteousness of Christ will humble the glory of man into the dust? But if there was a time when every nerve and every muscle should be put to stretch, it's now. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Faith, if it hath not works, is dead, for it is alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. James 2, 14, 17, and 18. The last call to the supper is now being given. The lamp of the soul must be kept trimmed and burning by being replenished with the holy oil. What parable is being referenced here? Can we not see the parable of the ten virgins? In the name of the Lord, let every soul now depart from all iniquity, lest the day of the Lord overtake them as a thief. The truth is to be proclaimed in clear, straight lines, but always as it is in Jesus. We need to beware lest we bring upon ourselves the rebuke of God found in Revelation 2, 4, and 5, and from Revelation 3, 1 to 3. I need two people, please, to read Revelation 2, 4, and 5, and another to read Revelation 3, 1 to 3. Who can help me with this? I'll read Revelation 2, 4, and 5. Thank you. Revelation 2, 4, and 5 reads like this. Nevertheless, I have some somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I'll come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of, thy, out of his place, except thou repent. What does it mean to you? to lose the first love brother it means like as you as you've been if i tell you're moving with in right relation with christ and then you reach a time and you get obsessed with the world and so you you don't even spare time for him you don't spare time for godly matters you lost in the world that's according to me how many times have we seen this happen within this movement? How many times have we seen those that have come to the forefront 
that have become to the point where they have lost their first love. So the admonition is given here that we are to repent and we are to do the first works. We are to have faith in what we are doing. And our faith is to correspond with our actions. Would you agree with that? Exactly. Okay. Who can read for me? Revelation 3. 1 to 3. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things that he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast the name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and remember the things. There's things in my Bible, unfortunately which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Does this passage say that we are to time set? It does say we're to watch, but not to time set. Right. So if we are watching, what are we doing? Following the lines of, of prophecy. I also noted where it says, thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Well, obviously these people are so lost that uh, they're not sealed. They don't have the seal of God. Would it not be well for us to be jealous of ourselves and be the doers of the word of God? If there be, therefore, any consolation of Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fill ye, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each Esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also upon the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 1 to 5. In constantly dealing with matters for the papers, many seem to lose their discrimination. May the Lord not only anoint your eyes that they may see, but pour into your heart the holy oil that from the two olive trees flows through the two golden pipes into the golden bowl, which feeds the lamp for the sanctuary. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Unless we are wide awake, we are not able to discern spiritual things. If we're not discerning spiritual things, are we watching? No, we are. Okay. We lose the sense of the power of the truth and handle sacred things as we handle the common things. The result is weakness and uncertainty. And we are not safe counselors or guides. Wake up, brethren, for Christ's sake. Wake up. You are not being sanctified through the truth. There must be laborers in the South who possess caution. They must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. All who engage in this work should be men who have their pens and their tongues dipped in the holy oil of Zechariah 4, 11 to 14. From where does this holy oil come? Well, from God's word. Exactly. But is this also not coming from those two olive trees that stand before the God of the whole earth? Does it not come through the golden pipes into the golden bowls? Mm -hmm. 
An unadvised word will stir the most violent passions of the human heart and set in operation a state of things that will close the way for the truth to find access to the fields now in such great need of workers. It is not ministers who can preach that are needed so much as men and women who understand how to teach the truth to the poor, the ignorant, the needy, and the oppressed people. Brothers and sisters, do we need people with more degrees? Do we need more ministers to go forward? Do we need more doctors of divinity to go into the field to give this message? Is that what Mrs. White is saying here? No. Okay. As to making it appear that there is not need of caution, it is because those who say such things do not know what they are talking about. How many times have we have we noted that there are many that are giving prophetic sermons that cannot explain the 2300 days, that cannot explain righteousness by faith, and that have no knowledge of the messages of the angels of Revelation 14. This needs men and women who will not be sent to the southern field by our people, but who will feel the burden to go into this neglected portion of the vineyard of the Lord. Men, while their hearts burn with indignation as they see the attitude of white people to the black, will learn of the master. Jesus Christ, that silence in expression regarding these things is eloquence. Where else has she stated that silence is eloquence? Dealing with what topic? I don't remember. I don't remember the topic. <laughs> As it's stated in the chat, the topic is the daily. What is the daily? How can we explain the daily simply? I can think of a single word that explains the daily. Again, thank you, brothers, in the chat, paganism. They all need the intelligence that will lead them to learn of Jesus Christ and the simplicity of how to work. Now, this particular document, which was non-published, also was repeated in portions with letter 102B of 1899 and SWK from pages 91 to 93. Take heed as to what you say, letter 117 of 1899. There is a promiscuous pile of rubbish in the shape of words which needs to be cleared up and buried. What does it say to you where she is addressing a promiscuous pile of rubbish? These words might better never have been spoken, for they make a vast amount of mischief. Can we see that the definition of the daily being Christ's service in the most holy is a promiscuous pile of rubbish. Turning things upside down. Very much it turns it upside down. I agree. But how many are we running into today within the church that believe and take the daily as being Christ's ministry in the most holy? And they almost, said, almost, every, almost huh? everybody. That's right. Almost, almost everyone. Yet, is that the way that that it is when we examine the Word of God? Certainly not. Let each one look to his own spirit. Let each one look to his own heart and life. And by the help of God, cleanse himself from everything that defileth. Then he will be prepared as a cleansed vessel to receive the holy anointing oil. What does it mean to be cleansed, a cleansed vessel? from what we studied over the last couple of weeks. What are these 
shown as being symbolically. Okay, one comment in the chat saying, much like the work of the dirt brush man in William Miller's dream, but yet over the last several weeks, we have these two olive trees with golden pipes coming to what? Where is the oil being being presented? Where does it flow to? Pure, clean vessels. And those pure, clean vessels are being symbolically shown as what? Are they not the golden bowls? Mm -hmm. So here she's stating that these that walk by faith, pure faith in Christ, will be prepared as a cleansed vessel to receive the holy anointing oil. The prophet of the Lord asked the question, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The golden oil is poured into clean, pure vessels to be imparted to others. This is what every soul needs. We want the holy communications from heaven and less rubbish of talk that only piles up difficulties. We want none of self and all of Christ. As this theme continues, the work of purification is a group work, right? The, um, go ahead. Individual work. It's an individual work. Okay. There is not a way for any others to purify us. We in cooperation with the Spirit of God are responsible for our purification. No one can do this for another. If a man therefore shall purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the Master's use. Second Timothy 2.21 the Spirit of God will work through human agencies, leading them to do missionary work. Ability and grace will be provided for the work. There will be a disposition to teach the truth of the gospel firmly, decidedly, in clear lines, from love to God and man. The cleansed vessel is prepared for the holy oil. Can this vessel be cleansed without righteousness by faith? Is that possible? Oh, no. Okay. So now, brothers and sisters, all of these items that we've been addressing, all of these that we have been considering, are coming together in the different presentations. Whether we are able to attend on Friday evenings, whether we are able and willing to attend with the different presentations and studies that we have come on on Sabbath, whether we are able to come to the morning meetings, all of this is pointing toward this work of purification this individual work. We have been shown that the upper room experience, while it was and came together as a group understanding, it began as an individual work. Each heart in that upper room was knit one with another. Each one were cleansed and were prepared for the holy oil that is shown in Zechariah 4. 
we need to ask ourselves today, is this where our heart lies? Is this what we are seeking at this time in this earth's history? Any other thoughts, questions, or comments from what we have addressed today? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these admonitions and for these warnings. We thank you, Father, for the blessing that you are looking to bestow upon us. We pray for cleansing, Father. We pray for your guidance. We pray and thank you for your direction. Help us to read. Help us to understand. Help us to be guided in all that you would have us to do. Direct us now. Show us, Father, that that you would have us where you would have us to walk. Direct us more so that we may be able to show to others the character that you would want shown. I ask, Father, today for your blessing upon the meeting to follow. Guide us now. Be with us in all things. For we need you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.